Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's training on Tucker Smith. Of course, I would prefer to be with you all in person, um, but I hope this webinar will be informative and will give you something to look forward to once the museum does reopen. Um, we don't yet have an opening date for the Tucker Smith retrospective exhibit that I've heard, um, but you will hear from me as soon as I know and as soon as those dates are confirmed. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, with this Zoom webinar as participants, you guys will not be able to um, speak unless, you, unless I turn you on. Um, so what I want you to do is use the Q&A feature and the chat feature. And they're located at the bottom of your Zoom screen on your computer. If you don't see them, just move your cursor or wiggle your mouse towards the bottom of the screen and they should appear. Right in the center, there's one that says chat and it has a little word bubble. So there will be a couple of times during this webinar that I will prompt you to use that chat box um, to sort of have a discussion. Um, but you can also use that Q&A with the two word bubbles. It's towards the left on the bottom. Um, click that Q&A box anytime during this webinar if you have a question or really even a comment. If there's other staff on this webinar, they may be, answered, may be able to answer questions that I can't. So feel free to just pop a question in there. And even if we don't get to it today, we can um, get back to you and get you some answers. Um, so once you've clicked on that Q&A chat box, you can type, um, there's sort of a panel will pop up on the right hand side. And at the bottom of that, it will say type message here or type question here. Just type away in there and then hit enter when you're finished to send it. Okay, so I promise it's easy, um, but hopefully it'll work for everybody. Um, I want to start just for fun to start with a poll. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see my presentation now. And I, you should still be able to see me up in the corner of your screen. Okay, so the poll, here are four images of Tucker Smith paintings that have been on view recently. So tell me, in a few minutes, a, a poll will pop up and you can just click on it. Um, in a couple minutes, tell me which one is your favorite. We have number one is Rocky Mountain Goat, number two, Below Grinnell Glacier, number three, The Refuge, or number four, Bighorn Rams. Okay, here comes the poll. Results are coming in. So far we have 11% saying Rocky Mountain Goat. Nobody for Bighorn Rams yet. I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay. Most of you have voted, so I will end that. And overwhelmingly, not surprisingly, the refuge comes in first at 67%. Pretty cool. Okay. There we go. All right, so the upcoming exhibit of Tucker Smith is titled A Celebration of Nature, and it's a retrospective of paintings that span the entirety of his career, from his early years as a professional artist up to his most recent work. 
The information that I'm presenting to you today is from the National Museum of Wildlife Arts, really beautifully done exhibition catalog um, that I'm really excited about and you should be too. of subject matter that Smith has undertaken over the years. Um, he's done Western wildlife, camp and cowboy scenes, straight up landscapes, and even one railroad painting, which is another subject for which Smith is highly regarded. Smith paints in a realistic traditional style. In his artist statement, he explains, Byron Price, guest curator of this retrospective, asked me what I wanted people to take away from the exhibition. The primary answer lies in the show's theme and title, A Celebration of Nature. I hope viewers also recognize that today our art world is trending modern. Different has become synonymous with creative. Painting has been advancing for over a thousand years through the development of materials, processes, paint application, and the way we have learned to see things. Craft and drawing are extremely important for an artist to be able to communicate what they see and think. Do we appreciate what we have inherited? Tradition need not be replaced by something new. It can be re respected, understood, and serve as a foundation to be built upon. I don't pretend to be able to represent the levels that fine art has achieved and can attain, but I do think I represent tradition. Tradition is what makes us who we are and allows me to celebrate nature. I'll talk a little bit about his process. Nearly five decades of painting have not diminished Tucker Smith's enthusiasm for the subject at hand. He still looks forward to going into the field in search of poetic moments and approaches each opportunity with open eyes and an open mind. When presented with a promising subject, he almost always uses photography to record the color, lighting, and other details. But he is careful not to allow the camera to dictate the future course of his work. Tucker fills sketchbooks with quick gestural pen pencil sketches and will sometimes complete a small oil study as well. Whatever the circumstance, the artist declares through every photograph, sketch, study, and finished canvas, this is me now at this moment. I am on the spot. A student of history, Smith gains special satisfaction from reinterpreting views that attracted the gaze of such master artists as Thomas Moran, Albert Beardstadt, William R. Lee, and Carl Rungus. When I am presenting, I can't see the Q&A very well. So I might stop the share for a second and see. Okay, nothing there. Not sure how I could maybe do that, but we will keep going. Oops. Um, bear with me here. Share screen. Oops, I think I went too far. There we go. A disciplined professional, Tucker Smith thinks about one painting at a time and approaches each composition with deliberation, experience, and creativity. Although his style has become looser in recent years, the word shortcut is not in his vocabulary. His paintings are always carefully composed with balance and harmony, and invariably have a distinct point of view and a clear and satisfying path for the viewer's eye to travel. So for me, Tucker is really a master of composition. And so I thought we would talk a little bit about composition um, because it is such an important factor that makes a painting appeal to the viewer. I think a lot of times it's really the reason someone likes a painting, even if they don't realize it. Um, a good composition should not only be pleasing to the viewer, but should ensure that their eye is guided to the regions of the image that are most important for understanding it. Many artists are taught that the composition of an image should be designed so that there is an easy way for the viewer to enter the displayed image and should not be let out of the image too early before they've had a chance to visit all the important areas of a picture. The viewer should enjoy a slow journey that meanders through points of interest. And there are various techniques that are employed to do this. 
Um, one is contrast, which can mean light versus dark, or it can refer to color changes or texture differences. Um, line direction is another way, um, and those could be lines that are actually real solid lines, or they could be sort of perceived lines, um, or even individual brush strokes. Examples of edges and gradation are hard versus soft edges, um, distant objects appearing grayed or bluer, with closer objects appearing more saturated. And the visual weighting of the picture elements, position, color, and movement, or the idea that heavy items sink and light items float. So if something is sinking, it's moving your eye down, and if it's light and floating, your eye will automatically go up. So we'll look at some examples of these techniques by looking at three images a little bit deeper. And these are images that will be displayed in this exhibit. And so I would love it if you would kind of participate in this by typing along in the chat box. Um, and keep in mind that there's really no wrong answer here. Every individual is gonna be sort of attracted to different parts of a painting based on their own preferences, their own experiences. Um, but the point really is that the artist has made decisions regarding the placement of images very intentionally. He wants the viewer to take time to notice the details. So the first image here, and this is not a great image, I understand, but hopefully you'll get the picture. Um, this is called Island in the Sky. It's from 1985. It's an image from Canyonlands in Utah, one of my very favorite places. Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes to look at this image. I'll give you some time to consider um, what do you notice first and why, if you'd like to answer that. If you saw this piece in a room with nothing else, what do you think you would see first? What would catch your eye before anything else? Now I can see the chat box, I think. Maybe, nope. Okay. Gigi says she notices the tree first. Yes, Katie, you are muted. I cannot hear you. Uh, things will start blinking orange. That's helpful. Thank you. Someone says they notice this fumato. Nice. The hazy quality of it. Um, the shadow cast by the butte. The foreground pinnacle the tree and then shadows. I'm torn between the tree and the top of the central mountain. I notice the tower in the foreground first and then the juniper in the lower left corner and then my eye goes to the mesas. Laurie says the bush. I first notice the butte in the front with its dark shadow behind it. I see the cave-like lines. These are all great responses, guys. Thank you. All the red dirt. I see the shadow and the tree. Yes, you may see the painting again. Let me go back here. We will look at it and I will tell you, here we go. Sorry about that. So what I see first is definitely the tree. And for me, I think, I think the reason for that is the color, the color contrast, um, because there's not much else that's that intensely green in this painting. Um, that's where my eye goes first. Um, if you want to keep going in the chat, tell me, tell me the path that your eye goes, whoops, from the tree. Once you see the tree or once you start in the painting, then where does your eye go? There are leading lines in the rocks. That's great, I agree. This is by Tucker Smith, yes. The contrast between the warm and the cool tones is what I noticed first.
The top of the spire is in front of a dark background. That is true. Gigi says her eye travels right and around the pinnacle. Yeah, so I think we all have a pretty similar, pretty similar path. It's just very interesting to me to think about um, if people see things really differently um, or if, if it's really successful or if this is even what, what the artist intended. We don't really know. But for me, there's like a trail of breadcrumbs from the green that comes over here and I follow this greenery here and I follow these rocks. And then this harsh line right here, this hard edge, I follow that right up. But there's a little bit of a subtle green over here too. And sometimes I think that color, a similar color, your eye will just kind of bounce to. So I bounce around to the greens too. Oh, this mouse is so sensitive, sorry. Um, once I'm back here, I tend to follow this shadow and come on back here and check out all these mesas and then back here. And then I notice, oh boy, I'm gonna have to get my mouse instead of using this. Um, once I'm in the background here, then my eye kind of follows this blue of the sky and travels out. So it's this really nice pathway through the entire painting and then off to the side. Okay, so I'm gonna go flip to the next one. Oop. This one's called The Branding from 1988. And there's a lot going on in this painting. Um, spend a couple minutes to take this one in and describe to me sort of the general path that your eye takes through this painting. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. This is a really good um, exercise, I think, for the act of slow looking as well. If you're in a museum or in a gallery and you start thinking about this and, oh, what's the composition of this painting? What are my eyes doing? It really forces you to slow down. There it was. Oh. I think I saw it. Nope, that's not it. No, don't do that. Okay. I don't know how to see the chat when I'm sharing the screen. This is kind of weird. So I'll stop sharing this again and look at the chat. Jackets. Okay, somebody noticed the jackets, the red, the coat colors really jump out. The smoke is lovely, that's true. The light in the foreground and spotlight on the man with the chaps. Yeah, I agree. My eyes first fashion on the orange red jackets and then travel left to the red and the sign at one cowboy's feet and then my eye travels up with the smoke. It's a good job. That's very descriptive. Um, so kind of like the green in the first one, in this painting, the red, your eye sort of bounces from one red thing to another. You feel it's a cold morning, but you can see the warm sunlight. That's a good comment. and sees the smoke first and then the jackets. The shadow in the grass is the first leading line for me. I think I agree with you, Charlotte. Um, for me, here, let me go back to it. So as I mentioned earlier, a line is a good way for your eye to follow. This is not an unbroken line at all. It's, it's not painted with a hard line. Uh, you can see the texture of the grass breaks it up a lot, but your eye just kind of reads this as a line. So for me, the shadow and the light is a really important 
thing in this painting. Um, for me, once I've come up here, right up this guy's leg and up the smoke. As I mentioned, smoke is light and it floats. So my eye kind of goes up to the smoke, hits this line right here and comes left. And then down here, wee. And then at this snow, there's a direction, a really hard like direction change. So I start coming down here and then down here, down this wood. And then there's all kinds of stuff in the middle to check out. Another interesting thing, I think in this painting, we have the red where our eye kind of follows, but we also have white. So the, the jars on the table, um, the buckets, the box, the white dog, the white of the smoke, the white of the snow. We have a lot of movement that way just by bouncing from one color to a similar color. The last image here is called Lost Cabin Creek. And this is from 1983. This exhibit, one of the cool things about this exhibition is that it will include quotes from the artists on the wall labels. Um, here, Tucker says, Cabin Creek is in the Tobacco Root Mountains of Montana. This painting is a result of another family camping trip. Although it is a small painting, it is a favorite of mine. It has all the elements that are pleasing to me. The eye can travel through the composition, the color is pleasing, and there's enough going on in the composition to hold, hold one's interest. Um, does anyone have a comment on this piece? Yeah, the vertical posts are important. And the last one. The water is amazing, very detailed, that is true. Looks like a warm summer day. My eye travels along the watershed backwards, the river toward the glacier. I'm drawn to the moose and then the water. Love being able to follow the line of the river. Along the river and back. This is a classic follow the water. And then my eye goes up to the glacier. My eye goes to the moose and the water. Tight, photo-like. Sees the moose first. Cool, that's great. So this lighter area in the water, because it's so much lighter than the water around it, um, is where my eye goes first. Right up here to this dark sort of line where it stops and comes up this way. And then you go, oh cool, there's a moose here. Hello, Mr. Moose. And then you follow this. And then for me again, it's like, oh, look at this beautiful white snow and there's white and here's white and here's white. And then I'm up here following these beautiful contour lines and this contour line. And then you get to enjoy this beautiful landscape in the background, which for me is really the whole point, this area back here. I love snow and shadows on snow. That's my favorite thing in a painting if I had to pick one thing ever. Um, so I like this one. I'm excited to see it when it's here. There's other really important things going on. Like to me, this, this clump of grass here in the foreground is there very intentionally because it helps weight the painting. It helps give the painting depth because we see that that's up close and the moose is further away and the mountains are really distant. There's a few more comments, so I'll check those. A wonderful presentation, composition of nature that I love. My eye to river, loved ripples on water, then moose and mountain snow. There's a falling tree whose bark is reflecting the light right above the moose. That's a good observation too. Um, again, that's intentional and for me it echoes the the shape of the mountain behind it. So if you didn't want to pay attention to the, the trees or the things that are on the right hand side, you could just follow that line and go to um, like a more direct path um, to the landscape at the back. Okay, uh, Tucker says, when I begin a wildlife painting, I must first decide whether it will be an animal painting with a landscape background or a landscape with an animal in it. This painting is clearly the latter. If both animal and landscape are given emphasis, they will compete with each other, providing an unwanted tension. So here is an example of 
an animal painting with a landscape background. So we know that this animal is important because he's obviously, he's very big. He takes up a good portion of the canvas. He's closer to us. He's harder lined. He's got more texture. The background is a little softer, a little more fuzzy, a little more grayed out. He says mountain goats live at or above timberline year round. In winter, they subsist on lichen and moss on the windswept peaks. They are great to paint because they are attractive animals and live in a most picturesque environment. Math. <laughs> Yuck, but good for him. <laughs> He's a mathematician. Uh, Smith became passionate about drawing at an early age and he carried an artistic sensibility with him to the University of Wyoming, where he minored in fine art while pursuing a degree in mathematics. Although he found the course of his creative studies disappointing in its emphasis on theory rather than practice, he forged ahead with his own art, learning by trial and error and studying the portraits of John Singer Sargent, the landscapes of Joaquin Soroya, and the nocturnes of Frank Tenney Johnson, among others, in books and museums. He took summers off from school and worked for the U.S. Forest Service, maintaining trails in the Wind River Range. Besides gaining valuable field experience among the peaks and valleys of the region, he also encountered some of the extraordinary vistas that still resonate in his paintings. After graduation, he landed a position as a computer programmer and systems analyst with the Montana Highway Department. Not surprisingly, perhaps, this straightforward and plain-spoken artist values honesty and emotion more than accuracy in his art and believes a work's size ought to be commensurate with the magnitude of the idea behind it. In 1971, after eight years of painting part-time, Smith resigned from his position with the state of Montana, determined to become a professional artist. Smith visited the Wind River and Grovant Mountains at every opportunity, sometimes in the company of other artists and always in hopes of finding the locales that had inspired Carl Rungus's brush and palette decades before. In the early 70s, Smith saw an exhibit of Carl Rungus's work. His paintings of wildlife and landscapes of the North American West were a revelation to Tucker. The fact that Rungus had executed some of his best works in the Green River region of Wyoming in the early 1900s only added to their appeal. Here's a quote from Catherine Turner. I cannot speak for Tucker, but we all hold Carl Rungus in such high regard. And you know that Tucker grew up in those foothills and I also think they are like kindred spirits. And Tucker is now channeling that artistic experience in this particular part of the world. It is such a remote place, and it was not very common for anybody in Rungus's time to go to the winds, especially a prominent artist like Rungus. It's kind of uncanny that an artist like Tucker also has a relationship with this very remote place. The winds. In the early 50s, Tucker Smith moved with his family from Minnesota to a log house near Pinedale in the Wind River Range. Nearly a century before him, Albert Beardstadt had trekked and sketched in the same vicinity with a military road building expedition. By 1895, Carl Rungus was visiting the winds on hunting expeditions. Here are two examples of paintings uh, from the Wind River Range that are in our collection um, by Beardstadt on the left and Rungus on the right. You should recognize these. Tucker, along with fellow artist Clyde Aspavig, made a trip into the winds with Bill Kerr. Clyde said, one of the most memorable trips into the winds was when Bill Kerr joined us, and we had photographs of the studies that the Wildlife Museum had from that area. We went around and found the exact spot where Rungus had done some of these paintings. We were at Summit Lake when we saw one of the white bark pines that was still in the spot, how Rungus had painted it nearly 100 years later. Here is a great photograph of Bill Kerr watching Tucker work on the painting entitled Pass Lake. Beautiful place, beautiful painting. I could jump into that right about now, go swimming. In 1993, Tucker and his wife Jean left Montana for Wyoming. We purchased our property on the Hoback Rim in Wyoming in 1993. 
In the northeast corner, adjacent to the National Forest, is a stand of large aspens where mule ears and other wildflowers proliferate. I named the painting Jean's Garden. They added a road, a house, a studio, and a barn to the property, which abutted a wildlife-filled national forest, and stocked it with a few horses, which they rode for pleasure, and on regular pack trips into the nearby mountains. With such wild, beautiful, and historic country so close at hand, Smith never ran out of inspiring subject matter. Right around the time Tucker and his wife made the move, the National Museum of Wildlife Art was outgrowing its town square location. Tucker's painting, The Refuge, was commissioned to hang in the new building. So you all know what's next, The Refuge from 1994. As you all probably know, since it's your favorite too, um, visitors remember The Refuge. Um, repeat visitors expect to see it. When it's not on view, the curatorial department often gets an earful. Typical of Smith's style, it features a harmoniously balanced composition and a peaceful subject. Smith does not paint scenes of animals chasing, eating, or stalking each other. His vision of nature is much more tranquil than that. Of this painting, Tucker said, I was extremely honored when Bill Kerr asked me to do a large painting of the National Elk Refuge outside Jackson for the new National Museum of Wildlife Art building. It was larger than any painting I had done. The pressure was on, and there were days when I wanted to scrap the whole painting. Jean and I delivered it in a four horse trailer one day before the opening of the museum. The direction and attitude of the elk are to lead the viewer through the painting. The natural contours of the hills lead back to Sheep Mountain. I put the top of the mountain in the cloud so it would not dominate the painting. As I mentioned earlier, Tucker has become renowned for his train paintings. The Challengers were probably the Union Pacific's most popular freight engines in the 1940s. They were powerful and fast. In fact, they were fast enough that they were also used on heavy passenger trains. The UP has a Challenger in running condition in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The railroad got it out of the roundhouse and ran it over Sherman Hill to Laramie so I could photograph it. In the painting, the train is on top of Sherman Hill with the Colorado Rockies in the background. Many works in this exhibit exemplify Smith's passion for nature. Below Grinnell Glacier, set in Glacier National Park, depicts a grizzly bear walking before a steep mountainside with Grinnell Glacier high in the background. Like the refuge, this painting engulfs us in a specific spot that has been purposefully set aside for the benefit of nature, wildlife, and humanity. Also like the refuge, this painting can serve as an entree into talking about topics we see in the newspaper every day such as shrinking glaciers, habitat connectivity, and endangered species. Although he cherishes the natural world and has worked to protect open spaces from development through conservation easements, Smith avoids politicizing his work, preferring instead that his paintings express unfettered moments of serenity and beauty that reflect his own positive life view. I'll share a few more images, um, just so you can get a glimpse at what to expect. Rabbit Brush, Lupin and Sage, 2002. Rainy Day, Golden Lakes, looks like it's really beautiful. Bonneville Light Show, very dramatic, and I think has a good story behind it. His quote I didn't include here, but I liked it. Um, prime Time. The boys of summer. So he's got some, um, some elk here, some deer, some horses, bison. Hmm, landscape with an animal in it or an animal in a landscape? This one's definitely an animal painting with a landscape behind it. This is definitely a landscape with an animal in it. So the plan is for this exhibition to travel. Um, it's supposedly, hopefully, going to go to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, the National Sporting Library and Museum, the Booth Western Art Museum, and the CM Russell Museum. So now that you've had a glimpse of the exhibit, um, go ahead and tell me if you want to, which pieces are you most excited to see in person? And also feel free to 
put any questions in the chat or the Q&A. Or if anyone wants to be unmuted to, to talk, feel free to let me know in the chat and I can unmute you. Bonneville Light Show, yeah. Looking forward to seeing the scale of Seed Skitty. Yeah, for sure, I have a feeling that one's really big. Excited to see any paintings I have not seen before, that's great. When might this exhibit open to the public? That's a good question. I have not yet heard a date. Was Tucker formally trained other than fine arts at university? That's a good question, Suzanne. Um, I have a feeling that, I mean, he, he minored in fine art um, there. Other than that, I, I really don't know, but we could find out if he studied under anyone. I'd be curious to know that as well. Lisa's eager to see below Grinnell Glacier because of his definition of space. I'd like to see them all. Totally, I agree. Is he represented by any local galleries? Hmm, that is a good question. I know that his work's been in the Jackson Hole Art Auction before, um, so I would assume that he's been sold through, maybe through Trailside, but I would have to check on that. Apart from when the museum reopens, when will the show be installed? Um, so I believe that paintings have been trickling in and curatorial um, is probably hanging some already. Um, last I heard the galleries were being painted. Um, at least, I think that was at least a week ago, so. There are a lot of paintings in the show, including the sketches. Um, I believe there will be over a hundred, which is true. There are a lot of paintings. In his call of the wild interview, he said no real formal training. Thanks, Laura. L yeah, Lori. Laura Bay. I think I've heard that too, Laurie, so that's great, thank you. Which galleries is the retrospective mounted in? So this is going to be in Bison and Changing Visions, I believe. How many paintings, Gigi? I think it'll be about 100 total. It's a big show. In today's paper, his paintings are at Taylor Piggott Gallery. That's good to know. I'll have to look for that article, Suzanne, thanks. Carrie says about 65 of the paintings are larger or finished works and the rest are studies and sketches. That'll be really cool too, to see the studies next to the paintings. I always think that's really interesting to see. Front page of the paper, right column. Awesome, that's exciting. What is the story behind the Bonneville Light Show? Well, I could find fairly easy for you here, maybe. I don't know if I still, I think it was what I was reading in the, in the exhibition catalog was basically that he was camping, he was out in the field and maybe he was already in the tent and someone came and woke him up and said, or got him out of the tent to say, hey, dude, you got to check out the light right now. Um, so he jumped out of the tent and saw that amazing light on the vista and was able to grab some reference photos um, for the inspiration for the painting. I'll give you a few more minutes to see if there's any more questions. Um, thanks a lot for participating in this today. Um, don't forget to log time in VicNet for volunteer training for this hour. I'm sorry this wasn't a full quarterly meeting and potluck and all that stuff, um, but it was great to have all of you here. And I'm recording this and I will make sure that you all have um, access to this after today as well if you wanna rewatch it um, and I'll send the PDF as well of this information. 
Western Art Collector just wrote an article on him and this exhibit too. And there's a link in the comments, so I'll make sure I share that with you all as well. Thank you for that. And it is our hope that Tucker might speak to us, um, to the public or um, to volunteers as well. The last I heard was that he was still interested in doing an in-person volunteer training. Um, I just don't have a date for that yet. So uh, it's a little premature to choose a date with all that's going on, but it uh, hopefully will happen um, sooner than later. I heard at one time he had volunteers to his studio. Will he do that again? That would be great. Um, we can certainly consider that. I think it's been several years since that trip. You're welcome, Lori. Thanks for being here. And yes, Gigi, you'll be able to print this presentation at home. I can actually probably send it out to you today, at least the PDF. I've missed these trainings. Yeah, I, I miss you guys all so much. Um, but we can do this again. Oh, actually, speaking of which, I do have um, a poll I can do here at the end just to make sure that you enjoyed this um, format or to give me some feedback on the format of this webinar and if you want me to do more. Um, so I will start that poll. It's another Q&A. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome, Ellen. So here's a poll just about, oh, that's the same poll. Oh no, did it not work? New launch polling. Oh, I don't see the post post-webinar poll coming up for some reason. Maybe I'll just send it to you after the fact, that's fine. Um, or you can just shoot me an email or let me know what you thought of this type of training. Thanks guys, this is pretty fun. Um, you guys have a good day, take care of yourselves and we'll see you soon at the museum, hopefully.